in Newton's law, whatever, which law? F equals ma together with the law of, um, of gravity. All right, so F equals ma together with the law of gravity tells us how objects move, let us say, how the moon moves around the Earth. And it predicts with infinite precision, if you could work out the equations with infinite precision, and if you could account for every detail of the Earth and the Moon and all the material that's in between and so forth, uh, it would predict with enormous detail, deterministically, the motion of the Moon. Which means if you know where the Moon starts and you know how the Moon is moving in the beginning, then you can predict forever after exactly how the moon moves around the Earth. That's the deterministic classical mechanics. Now let me imagine a modification. And the modification involves a little bit of randomness. For example, okay, so let's imagine God sitting on his throne, throwing dice. Every tenth of a second, God throws the die, and if he gets snake eyes, what he does is he gives the moon a little extra push in one direction. If he gets a seven, he pushes the moon a little bit in the other direction. A degree of randomness based on the random throwing of dice, and really random, a really random number generator uh, being used to put a little bit of fluctuation into the motion of the moon. That sounds like it introduces the kind of uncertainty, the kind of uh, thing that uh, one talks about in quantum mechanics. Uncertainty, um, non-predictability, unpredictability, but it is not anything like the randomness and unpredictability of quantum mechanics. The randomness and unpredictability of quantum mechanics is exceedingly special, exceedingly special and, and quite different. And it's that that we want to get our head around and learn and understand the difference between these things uh, by the time this class is finished. But also we want to learn how to use quantum mechanics a little bit to calculate some things. Um, let's notice one thing about this law which includes a little bit of randomness. The throwing of dice in order to, uh, to either kick the moon a little bit or inhibit the moon's motion a little bit. One of the things that would do is to add a little bit of energy or subtract a little bit of energy from the motion of the moon randomly. If you randomly give the moon a knock this way and then a kick that way and a bonk that way and keep doing it over and over again, each time you do it, this, on the average, it may not change the energy, but each little increment is randomly going to either increase the energy or decrease the energy of the moon. And if you do that randomly, eventually that will build up to a statistical randomness in the energy. In other words, energy would not be exactly conserved in a world in which the laws of motion included a little bit of classical randomness. I call it classical randomness. Uh, to distinguish it from quantum randomness. In quantum mechanics, you prepare a system the same way that you might prepare the moon in an initial uh, situation. You let it go for a while and then you look at it. And indeed you discover at the end of it that what you measure is a little bit unpredictable. But you also find that energy is exactly conserved. No hint, no remnant at all of energy being uh, knocked this way and knocked that way. If you start it with a given energy, with a given precise energy, and you let it evolve for a while, and you measure the energy later, the energy is exactly the same as you started with. Right? So there's something funny about this randomness. It seems to affect some things and not other things, and doesn't work the way you might expect uh, randomness in classical physics to work. Let me give you two, oh, I think three other examples of the oddness of this randomness. The first comes from an experiment which, to my mind, shows the weirdness of quantum mechanics in the easiest and most straightforward, least difficult way. 
much easier for my money than Bell's inequalities and all that sort of stuff. It's called the two-slit experiment. All of you know about it, or most of you know about it. If not, you'll learn about it right now. But it is extremely odd when compared with classical uh, randomness. Right? So, classical randomness just being this idea that every now and then you give the system a little knock. The two-slit experiment involves a source of particles. Those particles could be photons, they could be electrons, they could be neutrons, they could be bowling balls, except the effect for bowling balls is so minute that you'd never be able to measure it. So when we speak about particles, we think about things which are very light, and because they're light, the quantum effects associated with them are significant and measurable. All right, so we have a source of some kind. It could be a laser shooting out photons, but imagine the photons are coming through one at a time, very small number of them, uh, quanta of light, one at, a one at a time, one every five minutes, if you like. I don't know, just to go to a, some extreme situation. These are the photons coming out of the photon gun. And the photons pass through an ob obstacle with a little hole in it. All right, this is a two-dimensional diagram of a three-dimensional situation. This blue object over here is intended to be a disk with a tiny hole in it. So the photons can go through, uh, and they come out the other side of the hole, and when they come out the other side of the hole, they eventually get to a screen over here. That screen records the photon by a flash, a flash of light at the screen, not the flash of the original photons, but another flash of energy appears at a point on the screen and records or it could be just the blackening of a photographic, a photographic plate, something that records the position of the photon when it goes through here. Okay. Now first let's think classically, uh, but classically with a bit of randomness. The bit of randomness that we can imagine is that when the photon goes through here, a little random kick might influence the photon and either kick it upwards or downwards. In fact, by a random amount. What would we expect then? Well, if there was no randomness, then the photons would go straight through and illuminate a single point. Be completely deterministic, the photons would always arrive at exactly the same point, if the hole was small enough, and if the beam of photons was narrow enough. Okay. But now we can imagine a random kick. What does the random kick do? Well, it changes the direction of the photon, of the photon, not the whole photon beam, but one photon at a time. It might kick the first photon up a little bit, the second photon down, and uh, so forth and so on. Eventually, what you will see is a blob of illumination on the screen over here. On the average, the photon might go straight ahead, so the blob might be most intense at the center, it might be highly improbable to knock the photon through uh, 60 or 70 degrees, so the signal would fade as you moved away from the center. You would see a blob with a maximum intensity near the center and thinning out as you moved far away. And you might describe it by a probability function, the probability function being the probability that the photon arrives in different places. Okay, now we go, oh, now we do the same thing in real quantum mechanics, in other words, in the real world. We see essentially the same thing. The photon